I am a data scientist at Julia Computing, and uh, one of the you know core maintainers of the Julia machine learning ecosystem. It's it's called uh, the Flux ML stack, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about it, and we'll see how you know open source is actually pushing the boundaries as it uh, entails, you know, really really high end and um, you know edge computing and even even for that matter, you know, large scale HPC kind of uh, computing uh, clusters, and yeah, let's let's get started, shall we? So. This talk is all about uh, how Julia is, you know, positioned as a language for machine learning, really. And let's see. So this is basically the origin story. And uh, Viral Shah, again an Indian, who, you know, sought the need to, you know, do really, really high performance numerical numerical scientific computing, um, and needed a language which was significantly more ergonomic than, you know, the more performant options out there at that time. So this is this is in 2009, and uh, what we're talking about is something close to you know a C level performance, but you know with the ergonomics of say a Python, right? Because uh, a Python is a very very simple language to use for a newcomer, which means that it reduces the barrier to entry significantly. But it means that uh, programs written uh, purely in Python are not nearly as scalable, right? Because of the fact that um, you you really really need uh, you know, a fast kernel library underneath it, which is typically written in a low-level processing language, like Fortran or a C or whatever. And um, that is that is something that, again, does not scale. So the idea is to change the paradigm and enter Julia, right? So why they created Julia was for this very specific purpose. So uh, Jeff Besenson, Stefan, Allen, Viral all came together. Um, and they basically sought to change this paradigm, right? So the idea was that you have these specialists who've written all of this really, really uh, cool domain specific software, right? But the problem is that you can't really put it into production. You have to, you know, have this middleman who is going to translate it over to a to a production language or a performant language before anything can be done with it, which makes not only just the processing cycle longer, it also increases complexity. And in general, you know, it means that there is a less of a give and take between how, you know, an entire, uh, you know, this two language problem comes up, right? And frankly, it's an end level uh, language problem. So the idea of Julia is that they have to, you know, cut this cycle in short, make it so that, you know, we can uh, write all of our programs in a high level language while still getting the performance that we really want. So this is kind of you know why Julia came out to be, and as you can see, like the contributor stack for this is not just you know pushed by Indians; it's also something you know, that has been you know taken up globally. So it's it's something of a problem that you know we sought to solve. At the same time, we see that it has a very very large ramification when it comes to actual adoption, right? So like you can see here. Um, over 10,000 companies are using Julia in some capacity or the other, um, you know, in in very critical, um, you know, core infrastructure as well as for very high level, you know, research kind of applications as well, where, you know, you, you want to get the iterative workflow down, but at the same time, you really want the performance, right? Because that's that's what is ultimately going to go into production, essentially. So you, you see you have a very, very healthy mix of uh, companies that use Julia, as well as uh, many, you know, noted universities that now teach all of their courses in Julia, not all, but like some of their courses in Julia. Um, the reason being, again, you know, when they see that something has to be expressible enough to, you know, deliver pedagogical concepts. So be that for numerical computing, for scientific programming, for just computer science, um, the fact that you can, you know, go down and have all of these introspection tools available to you, so that not only can you see, you know, what a high-level construct looks like, but you can also go down um, to the point where you can see the native code. So that's a really, really strong sell for many cases where, you know, you have, um, you know, all of these universities that are trying to teach these different concepts, and uh, Julia is now increasingly replacing, you know, existing languages as the language of choice to be taught for the future. Um, as you can see, you have major universities backing that up, and Julia has seen rapid adoption. So Julia is, is 
not more than a decade old at this point and uh, many languages at, at this stage will not you know have this kind of adoption where you have not just the research uh, in the community stepping in but also the industry uh, shows the kind of confidence that people have on this language and it can actually be seen in things like the IEEE language charts right um, so the language ranking which is really uh, increasingly at a more and more uh, prominent position showcasing how important a role this fits in um, for not just numerical computing but for general computing as well and here's some stats like so this is, this is a little bit old so we have larger download numbers and more packages now but the fact is that you have a, a very healthy ecosystem of uh, packages that do all sorts of things not just numerical things but like we'll see how it's you know gone over to you know just just instilling the fun of programming as well in a lot of people uh, of course there's a lot of books um, so actually some of the books out there right now so for example the kinds um, by avik sen gupta is is completely you know again spearheaded by indians the idea again being that you know it's it's not just a very important role that this is fitting in but it's also an entire group of uh, you know contributions that are uh, sourced in globally but also have this very indian you know push as well in terms of uh, you know who um, has been adopting it india is actually one of the bigger uh, markets for julia at this point so um, julia as a language for ai right so why why was this even necessary and uh, one of the simple answers to that is as we have seen so these are some of the stalwarts of the machine learning world right yanda ko nanda ka party ko slatnor um so what they've seen basically is that deep learning as a paradigm has basically seen a plateau over the years and the plateau is is very simply put um you know we can make your models as deep as you want but there is a technical limitation to you know what kinds of complexities you can actually uh, encode in into the model whereas what you really want to do is have the structure of the program itself um, you know instruct how you know you you're going to be doing all of your learning techniques so not only do you want all of these uh, models to grow deeper and deeper and have all of this capacity but you also want to make sure that you know you 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 have to inspect whether or not that's the right approach right and uh, with differentiable programming the the concept is basically uh, turned over on itself right so the idea is that you don't want very deep models especially not if you don't need them uh, what happens rather than you know using very you know canned loss functions and very canned uh, layers what happens if i were to open up the you know ecosystem to be basically any code that you write so uh, so, so just just like that what if i'm opening a ray tracer to be differentiable right and uh, this is a differentiable ray tracer which is not written with differentiation in mind at all right and the idea is is essentially that you you just want um to have domain experts write the domain expertise uh, like instill the domain expertise that they have in the software itself and the the burden of differentiating it now comes down to other packages and other language features so not only you know all of this flexibility uh, we also see that julia is in fact very very performant right um, so as you can see julia is one of the you know uh, one of the early languages which was actually able to run on the tpus um so jeftin the the google.ai head at the time was very very bullish about uh, the possibilities of having julia and um, i've mentioned performance and and these are you know uh, realistic numbers that again come out of it so you have things like uh, csv loading is, is 30 times faster you, you you know for a fact that you know when you have an end to end application you have all of these different sub modules uh, associated with it and to gain performance is not to gain performance in in one specific area it's to gain performance across the board right and uh, this is just a demonstration of that same concept so when you when you are able to you know make even something as trivial as cvs csv loading uh, that much faster and not just csv loading it's it's about you know bringing in the data all of that stuff when you are able to do all of that uh, much much faster your entire pipeline uh, now becomes significantly more scalable right and uh, this is again compared to python so like you have uh typical things like uh you know python pandas being compared for example um 
So as I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, you have people globally contributing to projects that, uh, you know, you've started and it's already amassed about a thousand contributors, right? At the, at the time of uh, this talk anyway. So, you know, it's, it's supposed to uh, grow even substantially further. But one of the more important things that I wanted to point out was that even at this stage, like where is still considered, um, you know, as one of the major contributors and it's not just Viral, right? Like, uh, so, so one of the cool things about Julia essentially is that a lot of the language features don't exactly, you know, aren't exactly just baked in inside the language. Uh, since the package code and the ecosystem code is considered at par with the language, what that really means is that uh, you have this this entire flurry of uh, you know contributors who have open sourced their packages and have written packages in Julia in general, right? And um, as we will see that a lot, a lot of it is uh, also spearheaded by Indians. So uh, let me talk a little bit about Flux. So Flux already has a hundred contributors itself, um, which is very, very encouraging. But again, as you see, um, you know, again, not to mention that, you know, you have people like me who are contributing to it, but also, you know, we have an entire uh, gamut of you know, people. And I, uh, honestly, we have, um, you know, a lot of people contributing, specifically from India, uh, be that through, you know, regular PRs and issues and such, but also through, you know, um, our programs like participating in, in Google Summer of Code, uh, Season of Docs, um, MLH, uh, which is GitHub's, you know, seasonal com uh, conquest in, in contributing and encouraging open source practices. And as you can see, like, all, all of this basically entails that there are a lot of Indians and like for my myself, particularly the draw to me was, well, we, as, as I started, uh, you know, in my journey of learning what this, this entire domain of machine learning was, I quickly uh, came to, you know, odds that with the fact that, you know, whenever, whenever I was using, uh, you know, uh, oh, let me just, let me just uh, re retrace my steps a little bit. So I told you that it's not just, uh, for for very significant numerical computing, but also for just the fun of programming, right? And Pluto is is one such example where you have these reactive notebook styles. So it's very very simple, but it also means that it's very uh, lightweight and fast, but also really really pretty. So I would really recommend that you go check out Pluto.jl. It's um, it's somewhat like a notebook, in, uh, you know, front end something like a Jupyter, which people might be familiar with, but um, it's completely, uh, you know, for uh, you know, written written uh, from with Julia and my from the from the get go. Um, of course, Julia runs on all kinds of accelerators. So we saw TPUs earlier, but of course, GPUs. Um, and not only that, we are also formant at par with uh, CUDA C. And one of the reasons that that is very significant is the fact that uh, what we are able to do in Julia is we're able to directly compile our code to target these GPUs. So right now we don't even have to use the CUDA C library uh, it, you know, as, as a stock API if we didn't want to. So we can you know, just write uh, threaded routines which we can directly compile over to the GPU, which is a very, very uh, interesting accomplishment. And as you can see, there's a bunch of different applications that take advantage of uh, you know, GPUs. And one of the reasons why it is so prevalent is the fact that, you know, in normally if you wanted to, you know, you write a program and you want it to be compatible with, with GPUs, you have to you know, go through the entire process of making sure that you can actually make it so that, you know, you, you, you can interface with the CUDA libraries. You have to worry about all kinds of packages that you would need. You have to worry about what kind of support. Uh, your code base is completely different between CPUs and GPUs. That's something very, very common. If you, go to any you know popular uh, machine learning framework uh, especially you'll always see uh, you know a section called off just for implementing gpus um, in their own little special way but because uh, in julia what we uh, always acknowledge is the importance of generic computing we and generic programming we always make sure also to have uh, you know generic implementations for everything which means that if I were to write an addition routine once, I can use it on a CPU or GPU or TPU, whatever, and it would just work. 
which not only means that we uh, increase code reuse very very significantly but it also reduces you know the barrier to entry to actually you know start using all these uh, interesting accelerators which you know are again super important for uh, high end and uh, high performance applications and reducing the amount of work and rework that people have to do is again a push in the right direction if you ask me um similarly when you try to do you know data science you need the performance not just in the core kernels but in uh, you know further in different parts of the pipeline and as you can see this is another one of those areas that we spoke about earlier right so our typical operations not just for loading but also grouping for for transformations and such uh, we consistently see julia outperforming many of the you know, the typical methods that people are accustomed to um and why julia like that that basic question then comes up again right like why julia and this is basically why right because not only is it easy to use uh, it's fast it's scalable um, you no longer have this two language problem where you know you you have a um, a very you know performant but difficult to write program which is nothing like the elegant um, high level algorithms that people are writing to solve various problems right um, and all of that basically boils down to the fact that you need the best of both worlds you need the ergonomics of the language but you also want the performance along with it right um so yeah this is this is now harkening back to why i in, uh, you know got introduced to to the language essentially and uh, one of the reasons was simply that you know as i you know started learning about uh, you know different aspects of machine learning i quickly came towards with the fact that you know i was i was sort of restricted to the kinds of uh, you know exploration that i wanted to do not because i knew what i was doing but because i wanted to learn right and uh, at that point it it clicked to me that uh, as long as i keep using you know a pytorch or a tensorflow where i have these scanned operations written for me it's going to be very very difficult for me to break this black box to actually see what is happening um so for that you know you you turn to not just you know the literature which is you know you go to different um, you know courses that you're doing in college but also you know further down in online classes and just try to share this information and you and you learn quickly that it's all about encoding the structure right you want you want to get the structure right um when you see the progress of machine learning and especially how neural networks have been uh, developed you will find that uh, encoding the structure is one of the key themes that keeps popping up again and again and uh, not just is, is the structure that is important it's uh, you know taking over the the gradients and such that will actually you know help with our optimization routines but even before that what we really want to see is that rather than having these black box optimization uh, black box functions now i want to be able to write functions of my own right and uh, that was just simply you know very very um, difficult to do at the time and even is to, to this day um we'll see a little an an example of that uh, soon but the one of the real you know benefits to having this approach of uh, you know come of of stripping this entire notion of you know i have i have this blessed version of a of a neural network which is the only thing that will ever work is um uh, something which has in in all honesty has held back the kinds of operations and the kinds of exploration that can be done if we were to you know remove this restriction and um, simple question is what happens if we move the boundaries right what happens if we push these boundaries and as you can see this is this is a simple demonstration of a trebuchet right so um, you have an angle and a weight that it's supposed to you know throw the settled pebble at it has a target and um, you know there can be out outside factors like wind uh, resistance and such which need to be accounted for now typically the way this is uh, solved is with the help of uh, you know differential equations so these odes which will encode all of these uh, different facets be they you know air resistance be they wind um, be they you know structural deformities inside the trebuchet itself 
but um, what would happen again if you like if i can train this ode without actually ever having to you know do all of the excess work essentially to train it because this is a very computationally expensive task training an ode um what if i were to replace it with a neural network right and um, that's one of the most strong applications of where you know the future of machine learning is moving towards that not only am i uh, you know able to say something something to the extent of hey how do i aim this thing what kind of loss functions am i looking at like how do i um, minimize the distance between where this thing ended up versus where it was supposed to go things like that right um it basically goes on to show again that uh, there is a significant need for you know having this very flexible approach to how training works and again as if i see if i if i were to replace it with a neural network it trains perfectly it trains um, very very efficiently as well as um, you know significantly faster also in some cases so this is just an example right but um, the fact is that if you were try to go uh, to even the pytorch forums where people have been trying to solve these interesting problems you'll find very quickly how often they run to the limitations of the framework itself um and since we wanted to just remove this restriction it allowed us to you know for free essentially as we like to call it uh, gain a significant portion of um, you know the kinds of applications that will happen over over the years at this point so um, as i spoke about encoding more structure one of the very common applications of um, the structural approach is is in reinforcement learning and this is um the cart pole from from open ai gym and the idea here is that you have this platform and you have this stick and you can move this platform um uh, either left or right and you want to do it such that you can hold the stick straight up so this is um typically done with the help of a reinforcement learning algorithm and again this um assumes little to no understanding of the environment it's actually running in um but this is the essential kind of example that you want out of it right like this is the kind of uh, after training result that you expect but the thing is reinforcement learning is is an imperfect science uh, to say the least and not only that it means that you know it requires a lot of complex code whereas the environment itself is very simple to uh, write you know i can figure out what kinds of uh, you know forces act on this uh, the stick what happens if i move left what happens if i move right and that's about it right but um, since my reinforcement learning algorithm does not have access to this information it means that it has to do a lot of guessing um whereas if i were to encode more structure as we do with differentiable programming what we see is that not only are we able to you know solve for our problems as you can see it works perfectly fine um we're able to do it significantly faster on the orders of magnitudes right um or sensory two orders of magnitude which is which is significantly faster and this is just one example um and the more important uh, point that i want to drive home is the fact that not only are we doing this for you know uh, newer applications that come out but we're also able to handle all of the existing infrastructure um exactly like it was meant to be right so now rather than having these very canned um convolutional layers or very canned linear layers we've opened up the box so to speak um to allow basically any function to act as a layer in in a neural network and that's essentially the idea of this as well in a manner of speaking so um practically people really just want to you know tweak around their um, loss functions but one of the things that we always talk about in uh in flux essentially is that we want to customize everything there is no single thing that we want to you know work um uh, to not have the user defined so one situation might be where you have uh, this is basically the mean squared error um nothing too interesting about that but you would note that um, this is how a mean squared error would be defined in in pytorch right versus this is how it is in julia now you would say that this looks very very similar right like you have a mean function you have output minus target and you're raising it to the second power that's fairly straightforward uh, why is that a problem now the problem comes in when you know you have to have 
things like these kind of implementations of torch right um, not only that it means that you need to now express output and target as, as these uh, pytorch tensors or these numpy tensors which may not be the case every time right um, and what it means is also that you have to make an entire amount of sacrifices to actually gain back the performance. Uh, this is what a linear layer looks like in, in uh, a PyTorch versus, uh, this is how we define it in, in Flux. Um, there's nothing more really to it than saying that, you know, not only do you want to you know, hold on to the performance, but you also really, really want to make sure that there is, uh, you know, as simple and as you know, close to uh, how we would actually interpret uh, problems to look like to be what the code reflects, right? Because if I were to show you some, some of this, um, it will take quite a bit of uh, you know understanding of the internals of what it is that you're trying to solve before you can even attempt to understand what this code is doing. Versus this is very, very, very sim simple, right? Uh, what this has allowed us to do is it has allowed us to, again, tap into um, existing scientific software, which is you know very, very um, already written to be very performant, um, but also written without you know machine learning in mind but um, suddenly we can add you know this this entire concept of machine learning inside these um, you know, scientific solvers and what this means that has given rise to this entire field called scientific machine learning um, you can read about it all on you know SciML. Um, i encourage you to and as i mentioned earlier you not only have all of this future looking uh, stuff available to you today, but also, you know, all the kinds of uh, modeling that is prevalent today, right? Is prevalent to uh, solve problems that people have been trying to solve. So like image processing, uh, image recognition, object detection, text analysis, all of that stuff is, is all available. Um, but just as a generalization, we've pushed the boundaries to also accept a significantly more complicated, um, you know, uh, problem set essentially, and what it has uh, basically developed is is it has developed this entire ecosystem. So this is just a very very sim simple tasting of, you know, the the kinds of uh, modeling that people have done uh, over the years using this um, you know this this um, new concept essentially of how we interpret machine learning, and um, not only this, a lot of these uh, projects, so for example, SciML has uh, a large number of Indian contributors. Flux 3D is uh, composed entirely of uh, you know, Indian contributors. Uh, you have people like Metalhead, Avik Pal, again, uh, Indian contributors. All of these things basically show that, you know, not only is there a need, but also a capacity to hold, um, you know, all of these things. And India is one of the leaders, essentially, in how these uh, technologies are being pushed um, uh, forth. So of course you have you know uh, more complicated uh, you know projects like Optim, like Jump, which do numerical optimization. You have scientific machine learning, uh, which you know allows you to uh, you know incorporate both scientific computing as well as machine learning, um, and you have a lot of uh, different applications for this. Uh, not only that, um, you know you you can scale it out. Uh, with the cloud to a very, very large degree. So you have things like Alpha Zero, which is uh, a Julian implementation of uh, the Alpha Zero algorithm by DeepMind. And um, essentially the, the core takeaway is that it's, it's somewhere between 10 and 100 times faster than other high level alternatives, while still being under 2000 lengths of very, very simple Julia code. Um, not only that, it can scale to you know, in a very, very large number of uh, GPUs that you can throw at it, basically computing resources, right? Which shows the the power of an approach like this. And um, Julia Computing itself has a few offerings uh, for sure. If you want to, you know, reach out um, for not just you know how you can leverage Julia, but also how you know, things like Julia has been making uh, possible in different domains. So be that for pharmaceutical modeling, simulations. Um, or you know, in general, just to augment the use of Julia and your organization, please do reach out. And um, thank you very much. I think this is uh, time for me. So if uh, folks have questions, I'll be more than happy to take some up now. Thank you, Dehra. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Santosh. Uh, 
he is asking does julia inherited from gnu octave as operator semantics looks closer to it uh so no it hasn't uh, but what it really has taken up from is uh, you know it's it's taken roots from making sure that your code looks very familiar to the mathematical notation which is one of the things that you know, octave is good at doing um so you know it takes a basic you know uh, inspiration from everything from mathematica to you know even even python for its high level um, you know front end apis so it's not just one influence it's many many uh, different places that it takes influence from